that the UK government is becoming authoritarian in, in one way or another. Um, and I've seen some commentators who I feel are being um, sort of loose with the word fascist, using that to describe the UK government. I'm not sure it's quite there at this point. No, it's, um, it's totally inappropriate. <laughs> totally inappropriate. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I would say sort of... Uh, I, I, I like I, I look at them as as almost wannabe authoritarians in a way. They've they, they, with some of the moves they're making, like things like uh, the policing bill, um, the the dark money that's thrown around, um, the sort of revolving door, the the clamp down on journalists, the treatment of people like um, Julian Assange. They, they uh, the police had raided some art installation um, a few months back uh, that had. Uh, some sort of poster or something that the government didn't like and they raided it with like 30 police officers and there's lots of kind of concerning things like that going on and I was curious as uh, having uh, you, yeah you've looked at history is like is like how concerned should we be about this yeah well, so I came at history I mean I'm not a historian I, I, I came at history from a journalist's point of view on that even better an asker of awkward questions, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, or, or you know, the, so that's that's how I view myself. I, I try to I try to ask awkward questions. Obviously, that the, one of the dangers of social media as well is that people start to assume that people know everything or or have some mm -hmm. broad understanding of everything. And I, I'm happy to admit that I am ignorant about a vast number of subjects. So, <laughs> and I think it's very important that people do that as well. Um, mm. So, um, I don't understand the intricacies of the crime and, uh, policing bill, but I, I have a broad understanding of those things, uh, but, but not an intricate understanding. My take on Boris Johnson and the government is that they are essentially populists. Uh, now, yes, the Nazis to some extent were populists, and yes, authoritarian governments now across the world tend to be populists. That does not mean that the Conservative Party are Nazis or, you know, or like Erdogan or someone like that. But there is a danger that you start to go down that route. Not, not quickly, but, but slowly. Uh, mm. And people who go, oh, that could never happen here, which I find a really tiresome trope, yeah, don't understand history because Germany, for example, in the late 1920s and early 1930s was a fairly democratic, uh, you know, arguably one of the most democratic countries on earth. Uh, and very mm -hmm. quickly, in a time of turmoil, they fed into Nazism. Now, again, I, you've got to be very careful there because then people can weaponize that back against you. Oh, he says that Boris Johnson is going to become Hitler or something like that. No, <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. But um, populists are, tend to be fact-averse, complex-averse. They, they don't like awkward questions or people who ask them. Um, mm. And they don't like the history being challenged you know that the most vicious attacks on my book uh, have come from conservative historians and cons the conservative right who, who sort of how dare he sort of tell the truth and we all know it already you know uh it was a bit odd really <laughs> anyway, <never mind. laughs> um, because because all the commentators from people who've read the book oh, i never knew that anyway um but so with, with the populist thing it's very, very dangerous uh, if you just if you if you normalize lying and you make it okay for politicians to lie or just get away with things uh, and just just laugh it all off as Boris Johnson has done throughout his life. Um, it's a very dangerous thing because you just lower the bar and the standard of what is acceptable in government. Mm. And it's very difficult to then pull that back again to, to what you would expect of your government, you know. Um, and, you know, Boris Johnson has lied and lied and lied throughout his career just to advance himself. Um, and, and I find it shocking that he became prime minister. I, I'm, and I'm not a rabid anti-conservative at all. My parents were conservatives. The Conservative Party has and used to have in larger numbers some fairly sensible people in it, you know, and the people of the center, uh, centrist type conservatives are not necessarily wrong about a lot of things. But they've, they've, 
they've swallowed themselves up into this populist, small-minded party. And I think it's dangerous. Yeah, it's dangerous. And, and they have been enabled by the media, which sort of goes along with it. You know, you've got the mm. political character of the son, who is a friend of Boris Johnson and the ex-boyfriend of, of Carrie Simmons. Um, you know, he's like cheering them on from the side. There's no... And that, and that remains Britain's most widely read newspaper. So mm. uh, it's a joke, you know. <laughs> it's a complete yeah. joke. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you, do you see the press as the main issue here like i mean i've seen people people sort of there was a petition i think it's reached a hundred thousand signatures to criminalize lying in the house of commons which mm. i i mean I, that yeah. seems like it's very yeah it just seems like it's very open to abuse because then you have to pick someone who is the one who gets to decide what is the lie yeah. and, and for me that that just becomes very messy oh, but do you see the press you. as the main problem all these, all these regulatory bodies, uh, you know, whether it be Ofcom or you know, whatever, they take so long to to come to their decisions. <laughs> oh, we saw this over the referendum, you know. That, uh, you know, weird. I, I, I don't say this uh, in a fact. Weirdly, to their credit, the Leave side were brilliant. You know. They just threw truth out the window and said, let's go for it. We'll just make up a load of stuff and uh, mm. we'll press everyone's buttons. And meanwhile, the stronger in Remain camp was a complete chaotic mess of sort of numbers and there was no emotional case for the European Union. They just did mm. it on, on a sort of, oh, your phone tariff will be more expensive and, you know, and all this stuff. Uh, and um, there was no mention of the chaos that would come to Northern Ireland, for example. You know, I mean, there, wa there was. People were having that discussion, but they were having that discussion mm -hmm. on Twitter and Facebook. There was no broader debate. So you ca it turned into a sort of one of those video games where you've got people punching each other in a sort of fake boxing match and see who the knockout comes with. <laughs> there was no concern about truth. Maybe... Uh, regulating truth in the House of Commons would be probably almost impossible. But maybe the promises people make in big election, maybe we need to examine the truth of proposals put forward in things like, I mean, let's hope to God there's never a referendum in this country ever again. But if there is something like that, then you need somebody to be regulating that, and the, the people who should be doing that are the BBC, and and I am not a BBC basher at all. I think the BBC mm. is a great institution, but <laughs> they mm. should have not afforded such balance, so called, to the E referendum because it wasn't balanced. One side was lying, and the other side was talking about mobile phone roaming charges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i get well i mean i think we we disagree on that i i think the bbc was a great institution um i think they uh, i think it's it's coming very close to being beyond saving for me at this point they um they've lost almost all of my respect and there's still independent journalists in there like in individuals doing great work but when the head of the BBC is a Conservative Party donor, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, I just, I begin to lose trust because then it's just part of the revolving door that, that already sort of has, has sucked in the media and much of the, the kind of like establishment or ruling class or however you want to define it. Um, and I get, yeah, I feel like the BBC is, it needs like root and branch reform to become what it, Aspires to be and used to be. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, although there's a danger there that we sort of think there was some rosy nostalgic moment in the past, and the BBC was, um, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe again, a bit like a nation. We aspire for the the BBC to be what we want to believe it was when it was never quite that in the first place. I mean, the BBC, BBC's overseas 
foreign coverage, world service mm-hmm. stuff is, is very, very good. You know, they're very good at holding other nations <laughs> to account, <laughs> like Russia, for example. Um, mm. uh, the Russian, um, the BBC's Russia service, you know, r- journalism about Russia and Putin, I think, is outstanding. Uh, and the, a lot of the stuff uh, in, in the Middle East currently is is good. But, but in the UK, yes, it's... Uh, it does need a kick, definitely. I mean, they, they've always put in um, director generals. Administrations have forever put in director generals who were friendly to the administration. That happened under Blair as well. Uh, mm. I don't think that's a new uh, thing, mm. but um, yeah. Um, that seems like- Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast. Don't forget our sponsor, ExpressVPN, and my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, can both be found in the links in the description below. And also, please like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. It's the best way to help us grow. Until next time, thanks for listening. Screw the hedge funds. You can make as many rules as you want, but if there's no teeth behind them, what's the point? Like Citadel is potentially just gone in a few months. It feels like financial institutions, that they are all laughing at us by buying GME. (laughs) Screw the hedge funds. Like I will lose my entire investment if it brings them down. Why on earth last May could you buy the entire company for $200 million? What's been happening on Reddit and in social media and in the marketplace? has never been seen before. I argue that nothing is off the table. There is nothing off the table when dealing with the volumes of money in something as big as the United States uh, stock market. The hedge funds have clearly underestimated a group of a group of people raised on Friday night World of Warcraft raids. Dark pools, they are they're another uh, mechanism to manipulate and cheat. Mainstream journalists don't say these things for a number of reasons. Uh, One is their sources are the people that I'm talking about, and so they can't call somebody a crook. Super Stonk and the other communities that have emerged are a hive mind, the likes of which we have never seen before. It's madness and brilliance, insanity and genius all rolled into one. It's very possible that Citadel will be gone in a few months. And and not just Citadel, but the entire financial system has the potential to come crashing down. These crooks continue to gamble recklessly with the world economy, and this could be the moment that they finally get their justice.